Hey everyone, this is Captain Chris from The Speckled Truth. Tonight we're going to talk a lot about uh, trophy trout, uh, moon phase, and in the sullener and understanding the sullener. So I'll kind of let everybody kind of filter in just for a second and uh, we'll go ahead and get started. <clears throat> All right, yeah, some folks coming online now. Okay, so um, a lot to cover tonight, especially with regards to, I think, uh, something that I've really kind of uh, didn't know enough about, right? And so getting after it a little bit with the Dirty 30 and the Trophy Trout Citation stuff, I'm actually starting to see a lot more compatibility uh, with regards to Trophy Trout and uh, understanding a little bit more about moon phase and in the cylinder. And so I've talked to uh, a couple of different folks on some podcasts. So I did Salt Strong, and then I recently did uh, one with Tom Rowland that'll come out here within the next like two weeks. And so uh, we talked a lot about understanding the cylinder and in moon phase and how it relates to, to trophy speckled trout. And so um, <laughs> it's good to see some folks out there, that's for sure. It's been forever since we've really done one of these, and that's on me because honestly, we've been going, or at least I've been going through a little bit, uh, a lot. I'm actually nursing kind of a, uh, a shoulder injury right now, and so I haven't necessarily been on the water enough. And so uh, in addition to that, I got a real bad sinus infection, and then with my wife's birthday anniversary, it's, a, it's just kind of the time is getting biased. But I uh, was able to fish quite a few days uh, in March, and in, uh, not as many days in April, and they've been really good. Um, and I want to start with that because it relates to kind of the topic at hand, and that is trophy trout, moon phase, and then understanding the cylinder. And so, again, going back for me, I live uh, three hours from the coast. And so that's a stark contrast from when, one, I grew up in Louisiana, and then secondly, uh, living in Florida just recently, and so had a, a lot more accessibility to the coast. And so I was able to go a lot more often. And so I didn't put as much stock and as much faith into the cylinder. I did always kind of understood the moon phase, but not so much the cylinder. And so um, <clears throat> now that we um, live in, in San Antonio and being three hours from the coast, I have to try to pick and choose those days in which I go uh, down to the coast. And so I, I started putting a lot more stock into really increasing the odds for me and stacking the odds in my favor. That way, when I actually do make a trip to the coast, uh, and I try to fish five days a month. And so when I, when I get down there and, and go fishing, the odds are stacked in my favor. And so now I'm going to fish, I think, high productive spots because they've been productive for me in past. Not only that, but they've been productive for me this year. Um, but I'm going to go and increase my odds when I'm waiting those really uh, high potential areas and then and, and be more productive, right? And so I'm not just spitballing going anytime I can. If I can pick and choose days throughout the month that I can go, these are the days I'm going to go and they're based off of moon phase and they're based off of cylinder. All right, so uh, my dad, he would... Um, <laughs> He'd always say the story. We all we lived in, in Metairie. We'd go uh, fishing uh, before we had the camp down in uh, Happy Jack Canal in Port Salt, Louisiana, down in Plaquemines Parish. And on LA-23, there's surrounded by cow pastures. And so he would always tell me um, as we're driving down um, to look at the cows. And if I notice the cow's feeding behavior, uh, that's a good indication of the day, right? And so he'd always say, the cows are feeding, the fish are feeding. And so he also said that if the gnats are biting, the fish are feeding. Uh, but really, the cows are feeding, uh, then the fish are feeding. And so that directly ties into this as well in cylinder. And so moon phase, we get that. We understand the full, the new, you know, the crescents and everything else and the quarter moons. But cylinder is different because that is an impact on, a, on, a, on an animal's feeding behavior, right? And so um, I'm not even going to try to potentially quote it, but uh, you can Google search it or whatever. And so when it came out, it's actually a pretty age old kind of tale. And so what the guy did when he created it is he had a bunch of different aspects of the cylinder rating because he figured there was um, a moon play on animal activity and how they're feeding. 
And so what he did is he created these like 33 parameters, I think is what it said. And really the, he kind of tailored them down to three, right? And that was the sun, the moon, and the tide. And so when you throw those things together, that's when you get the cylinder tide charts, right? And so when you see cylinder tide charts and you see cylinder charts, it's really based off of those three things, which is sun, moon, and tide. Okay, so how that relates though is so you have the cylinder, right, the sun, and then you have whether that's coming up or setting and then overhead and underfoot, and then the, on the opposite side you have the moon, which is the same thing, the moon rise, the moon overhead, the moon setting, and the moon underfoot. And all three, and both of those things really create the kind of gravitational pull, and as a result, it gives feeding behavior to these animals. And so animals in general obviously have those two factors. And in the inshore saltwater area, that's when you have to factor in tide. And so if you can factor all those three things, that's there are days that are higher uh, naturally because of the way the sun sets up and the moon where it's placement is in the in the sky and then ultimately your tide chart as well and how that's dictating whether you have a an incoming getting ready to flip to a fall or whatever whatever right and so that's the biggest thing so I started to try to understand what was the correlation between really moon phase so understanding the moon phase first right and whether or not that has an in, impact on trophy speckle trout and so that's where the Dirty 30 and the Trophy Trout Citation stuff really comes in handy. And so I started to, and I'm writing an article too on Louisiana Sports, and it'll be in the next month uh, about this. But he, here's what I figured. So in the last really two or three podcasts, it's always been understood that Trophy Trout come on a new or a full moon. There's really no secret. That's been kind of the age old adage or theory and based off of kind of what we have here in the data set, that's really true, right? And so the last three podcasts that I did, I actually somewhat misquoted uh, what I thought to be true. And so I said in the Salt Strong podcast that the new moon and prep for the new moon was actually a little bit better than the full moon. And so I really, and the reason I made that assumption was based off of the actual. Um, so I broke it down like a month into four quarters. So it was like the first through the seventh day, the eighth through the 15th day, and then so forth and so on. And that's a result of, I basically wrote down every full and new moon for each of the months. And so what I did is, I figured if it was in kind of that first quarter of the moon phase, or if the first seven days of the month, let me back that up, that it was in prep for the new moon. And so after that would kind of be coming off the tail of a new moon and in that third quarter if you will so that would be like the 15th through like the 22nd or 23rd that would be like your third quarter of the month that would be in prep for the full moon because new moons this year are earlier in the month full moons are later and so by the catch data that we're getting are we seeing a correlation with them coming closer to the moon phases in times of the month, right? And so that's where I started to get through it. And I'm getting to my point of mis getting being misquoted. So in the the trophy trout citation uh, data that I have, so the data set that I have, we obviously have a lot of a lot of entries. I can't even remember, it's close to like 80 or almost 90 across all the different states. And so um, I, I like to use Texas, so not only because I live in Texas, but it's the largest sample set, right? And so it's the, it's the largest because right now there are 70, 71 entries into uh, Texas. And so what I'm starting to see is month after month after month after month, if there were a high, was a higher correlation in not only the number of, of citations reported, but as they relate to the actual moon phase. And so... Just in um, the Texas data alone, if I broke it into those four quarters, the first quarter, which is the first seven days, is 19. So 19 catches came in the first seven days. Quarter two is 15. Quarter three, which would be really day 16 through 23, was 13. And then 
quarter four, if you will, is kind of after the full moon because that'd be like the 24th of the month through like the start of the new month, right? And so that was 23. So 19, 15, 13, and 23. That tells me that um, the first and the fourth quarter, so pre-full, pre, excuse me, pre-new moon, post-full, has more catches. I mean, that's what we're seeing, right? And, and more catches reported on the days caught. And so that tells me that that is a, really a higher period um, of catch. So if you if you're going to increase the odds, go pre-new moon, right? So I started kind of digging into it a little bit more. I normally don't do it until the after part uh, of the dirty 30 since we only had the dirty 30 last year but since we have a pretty large sample size up to this point um, I figured I'd go ahead and start kind of taking a peek at it but here's here's where I kind of I kind of go back um, on what I said and, and, it, and it being kind of a misnomer because if you go back to the dirty 30 list which is just a 30 inch trout and above reported it's almost opposite. It's crazy. So same same concept. Eleven uh, or first or four quarters. First through the seventh was eleven. The second quarter was thirteen. The third quarter, which was the sixteenth through the twenty second of the month, was twelve. And in the fourth quarter was eleven. So we're almost seeing an opposite reaction for large. I mean, like super large trout, right? Thirty inch trout or above. We're seeing almost the opposite. So that tells me right there that, you know, maybe I was quick, too quick in the assumption of just saying that big citation trout, 27 inch trout or above are caught. You have a higher chance of catching them basically post full pre new versus really the dirty 30 says you actually have a better chance at catching them um, really post new and then pre full. So I was like, man, let me go back. Let me go back here and take a look at the uh, last year's Dirty 30 citation data. And so that was uh, 57 entries we had last year. And I wanted to see if it correlated to kind of what I'm seeing now. And so, let, yeah, here we go. So last year, again, the 57 we had uh, reported, I didn't count October. And the reason I didn't count October is because... Um, it was a brand new program, and we only had we had four that were reported um, during the month of October. But since it was such a brand new program, I didn't count those because we were still kind of kind of going through it. So I started November, and then I started again, right? And so starting in November, full moon to new moon, right? So post full moon to a new moon. Uh, last year's data was twenty three. Okay, there were 23 catches post full moon, pre new moon. So in prep for new. In uh, a new post new moon to a full moon, there were 30. So seven more fish. Now again, these are really small sample size. I mean, you're talking 50, was that 53, I'm not good at math, 53 uh, trout register or that I captured because again, I took out the four uh, from October. So that shows that for those big, big fish, that's the same because there was 25 uh, for this year and for post new moon pre full and then uh, 22 again for post full to pre. So it shows all that being said, um, it shows that post new moon pre full uh, has a natural and a higher tendency to um, have catch a 30 inch trout. I mean, it's, it's there. I mean, obviously we're growing this data set, but it, that's kind of part of the data. And so that's, that's the importance, right? That's why we give away a box and a sticker and all this stuff is because I'm learning more about a fishery. I'm learning more about a fish. Uh, we're learning more about, cause I'm sharing it. Uh, we're learning more about a fish and a fishery and how to target these things, um, a little bit better. Okay. So let me go back to that saying I said it for salt strong. And that was, um, I thought it was a higher tendency, basically post full pre new that you had a higher chance or a higher percentage of catching a big, big fish during that time frame. when in fact it's the opposite. So what's that tell me is that if you great, if you had that sample set, it's really spread across the board, which means there are no correlating factors to 
um, saying that one is better than the other, right? Because there really isn't. The short of it is really just go fishing. But then I started kind of thinking a little bit more about it. And I'm like, okay, obviously we're not seeing such a huge tendency or a correlation to, to moon phase, but this is where cylinder kicks in. And the importance of cylinder and understanding and reading a cylinder chart and at least infusing it into um, your angling tendency and your angling toolbox because it's vitally important. It's not 100% accurate. It's not, you know, the, the magic key, if you will. But what it does is it basically tells you those times of day that are going to be a, a higher... Uh, yeah, you're going to have higher periods of activity. So if you're going to catch a fish or a big fish in that particular instance, you might want to target and fish during those majors and fish during those minors. And so going back to me, this year, starting in October, because that's when I pick fishing back up because I take the summer off normally, um, I really started focusing on those days. And I started making my trips with purpose. So if you follow my actual personal Facebook page, I go a lot now during the middle of the week. I'll actually go on the weekends if the if I feel that it's higher, um, or if it's a high rating and the weather window is somewhat decent, I'll actually go. But this year, I, I posted seven citations myself, and so not to brag, but I'm saying it actually works. Now it did work 100% of the time because I didn't just go seven times. I went a whole lot. But on the same token, is if you're a diehard and you want to stack the chips in your favor, definitely put this into your arsenal and understand more about it. Okay, so understanding that cylinder, right? So, yeah, understanding the cylinder. Let me get a sip of beer here. Cheers. All right. So, you always hear um, like moonrise or moonrise major, or you hear moonset, moonset major, or a mid morning major, all these different. Uh, things that people describe with regards to um, <clears throat> kind of that that time of day, right? And so what I use, I use a couple different cylinder charts. I really do. Um, I go to Louisiana Sportsman. Um, I really do look at theirs because theirs is a great uh, conduit because it lays out the entire month. It really does. If you go to Louisiana Sportsman, you'll find it like one of their tabs or something like that. You can go to I think it actually says cylinder and you can click on it and what it shows is the actually shows moonrise and moonset sunrise and sunset and so those are really uh, the, the key factors and then it also shows how it relates to tide so Louisiana Sportsman's obviously a really good one I know there's others there's probably apps out there I don't use those apps I really don't uh, another one I use is rodandreel.com and it's r-o-d-n-r-e-e-l.com and so you can go to the cylinder uh, time frame there. So that, I actually have my wife's phone uh, because I'm not going to go ahead and scroll through that. But I kind of want to show you guys a little bit. Now, if I, if I turn this around, it's going to be backwards. I've learned that trial and error. But the idea is if you, <clears throat> if you go through those and you pull up that monthly tie chart and you look at the day that you're looking to go, there'll be four... There's four times. There's two minors and two majors. And the minors are actually only a one-hour window. The majors are two-hour windows. And so, again, that's based off of the sun, the moon, and the tide. So they dictate all three of those, the sun, moon, and the tide, and that gives you a major or a minor rating uh, for the day. Additionally... In the morning time, so fishing early in the morning at dawn or fishing late in the evening at dusk, that is called a natural feeding period, right? So that's typically when you would see because you're transitioning from, from dark to light or light to dark. And so it increases fish behavior. So at least during the day, you have two periods of feeding activity, and that's dawn or dusk. That's why it's important. Early bird gets a worm, right? That's why it's important for you to get out there and also, if you're going to make a late evening uh, uh, fish, to stay maybe and wade through that dark, obviously being safe with your navigational stuff, right? But it's really understanding the other two, right? And so if you look at your uh, cylinder charts, you might have a major, 
uh, in the morning time, right? And so let's say your major is at, let, let's say, 0600 to 0800 in the morning time. So not only do I have, not only do I have the sun coming up, but I have a major because maybe the uh, moon is overhead, directly overhead, or the moon is directly over foot, or the moon is setting, right? And so the idea is you have two sullener activity or yeah, sullener things that are happening together in tandem, and as a result, it creates a major. And so you fish during those high periods of sullener activity. Like a mid-morning major would be something that kicks off where maybe that moon is overhead or the moon's underfoot at 0800, right? And from 0800 to 1000, um, you get a really good feed. And so it'd be called a mid-morning major. And as a result, because you're coming off of what happens to be um, a natural feeding period with the sun coming up, all of a sudden those fish are feeding, that feeding window just kind of continues to extend, right? And it, and it almost kind of gets better. And so there's other factors to consider because that's when those fish are active. That's when things are active. You'll start to see birds flying. Uh, you'll start to see maybe some, some, some bait kind of flipping it and, and, and uh, getting busted on or something along those lines. Just look around. Things just look more active. And it's also being said on a, on a flip side is that Maybe when it's completely dead calm or something like that and you're in kind of a, in between those feeding periods and you're looking around and kind of scanning the horizon, nothing is moving. I mean, nothing is moving. Birds are sitting, the pelicans are sitting on pylons. You know, birds aren't diving uh, in the bay or whatever it is. And so what it is is just, it's kind of like a period of rest, right? Before they kind of pick, pick it back up. And so... If you've been out there and you noticed and you never really put a whole lot of faith in stock within understanding your cylinder, just be more cognizant of it because you're going to start to see, hey, uh, when were those fish feeding? Oh, okay, it was like early or mid-morning. I started to see, yeah, birds were busting. They were kind of, pelicans were kind of swooping and, and all these different things. And what you'll start to go back to that chart is you're going to start to see, hey, we're coming off of a feed window or coming into a feeding window. And so everything just started to get a little bit more active. Having said that, though, again, it's not 100%. It's not totally foolproof, right? Um, the other things you got to consider for at least the angling component is weather, right? So weather kind of rolls into that. Not only that, um, which you, so weather is one, right? Because you can come off of a post uh, front, you can have a really hard wind that just really muddies up the water or it might drop the water way too much or whatever it is it pulls bait out of a certain area and then that's when you also need to consider location so if you're going to use it you got to actually understand the weather right and kind of what it's doing and what's doing for the day and maybe some different factors of what's going on and how it's going to relate uh, but not only that location right so you then you gotta you kind of just have to have an, a general understanding of kind of where those fish are at right and so understanding that is vitally important so if there's fish in the area you're on the right quality of fish um, if you're on the right quality of fish or the right class of fish and now you've found them and you're coming into a really nice weather window where you're maybe a couple days post frontal or you've had a settling wind and um, again, you got a great moon phase, that cylinder, you want to be in that, I call a spot, right? And so Wayne Davis, when we did our, uh, when we did the Facebook live back in, I think like, God, I can't remember now, it was like January or something. Um, one of the things that he considers, right, during his guides, now he guides every day and he still looks at it because even though it's not going to necessarily matter to him or his clients about them actually going, what it's going to matter is where he's going to be placed and where he's going to be waiting and what he's going to be doing uh, during that certain time of day. So it still dictates to him, you know, what he's going to be doing that day. So even if he was on some fish and they moved, what he's going to do is try to find them. And then he has in the back of his head, what's going on? What's that next minor uh, feeding period? What's that next major? Because what he's going to want to try to do is increase the odds for a guest that's coming with him to then basically catch a big fish, right? And so you want to stack the, the odds and the, and the chips in your favor, and that's really a part of it. So I've heard a lot, and I used to live by it myself, and I see Pops is on there. Um, you would see like 
the day ratings, right, and all that stuff, and you'd see like, oh man, this day was rated nine, and this day is rated two. I can tell from first half, like, um, I used to, we used to kill them, you know, Pops out there, we used to kill them, you know, the trout on days rated two. Um, and we'd also really struggle on days rated like eight or nine, you know, and so, again, it doesn't necessarily, it plays a factor, it's not 100% foolproof, that's what I'm gonna say. We could have just been in the right location, everybody else struggles, but we just were in the right spot at the right time, we had bait, uh, we had good current, whatever it was, and we caught some fish, right? And that's just being out there, understanding your water, and kind of what's going on. So, understanding the weather and the location, and then ultimately infusing the cylinder, right? And those major minor feeding times throughout the day, and then also factoring in the time of the month, whether you're post full moon coming into a new, post new moon coming into a full, right? What I'm finding is there's a little bit less, um, again, uh, targeted towards you know those big fish eating on certain moon phases as much as I originally thought. But again, it goes back to they kind of eat definitely around those moon phases, but they don't. Um, it's not one or the other. Okay, that was a lot to digest and I'm sorry. Um, I kind of got in a roll there and so I see a lot of people out there um, kind of tuning in, uh, tuning out also and then also uh, posting some things out there. So ask questions. I mean, right, this is something that I'm still dissecting. I have a ton of data here. I mean, I really do. It's not just a yeah, it's a lot to, to digest. I understand that, but we're just trying to understand a little bit more about um, these big fish and then not only that moon phase and then taking that and then understanding how we as anglers apply that and understand the cylinder activity and then how it increases the odds for us to increase or and catch these fish. That's what the idea of this podcast is, is about. So, all right. Uh, what we got out there? I'm gonna I'm gonna have a, a couple more sips of beer, and uh, I'll let post post some questions, post some thoughts. If you have any questions about the actual citation data that we have thus far, let me know because uh, it's really important, or and it, and it's actually really interesting. Um, I'm I think I saw Chris Williams out there. He posted something. Hey man, this guy's fully invested in. Look, this is a labor of love. Uh, I I really enjoy this. I understand. This is what I do, this is what I focus on in terms of the only fish that I target. I don't go catch bass or any redfish, God, I hate those things. Um, but this is it, and so understanding more and more and more, I love it, and there's just a more thirst for knowledge. Anyway, um, what questions do you have? First off, is audio good too? Give it a thumbs up because I know last time we were struggling a little bit with audio. All right. So like I said, um, I'll go back to these. So this is the, the Dirty 30 citation list right here for this year. Again, across the map. Across the map uh, in terms of time of the month. Um, going back to the Texas citation uh, data right here. Again, across the map. I've, I've kind of talked about that. In terms of period here's what I did find a little bit interesting though is that um, I printed off the other three lists that had more than I guess one entry right and so that was Louisiana Florida and then North Carolina believe it or not bringing it in strong with 13 uh, actually 14 registered and what I noticed just at an eye test right and so looking at these I'll, I'll look at Louisiana first is that Going back to those quarters, uh, the, the first of the seventh, all that stuff, right? Um, the majority of the fish registered in Louisiana came during the middle part of the month. Now we're only talking a sample size of five, right? So, but three of the five came between um, really 10 and 20. So let's say the 10th day of the month and the 20th day of the month. And so I find that you know somewhat intriguing because that is almost in stark contrast to Florida which is, it has seven, right? And 
from one to 10, let's say the first day of the month to the 10th day of the month, of the seven, you have five of them that have been caught during those times. So almost an opposite. And actually the other two were caught at the very tail end of the month, the 26th and the 29th. So I just find that interesting that again, moon phase, as much as I thought, um, there was such a correlation to these big fish and one being better than the other, I really don't think that that's true to some extent. I think as long as you're fishing one or the other, I think that's really the better component to it. As you get closer to those moon phases and those big moon phases, that's when you start to increase your odds too, right? Coming into a new, coming into a full. I didn't see a whole lot of correlation um, like couple days after again it was like seven ish days right and so you started to see a little bit more um, of those fish being caught after like a week span so it's interesting too. look at social media social media is a great indicator as well and it's almost predictable to some extent now because what you'll find is and it goes back to those fish and feeding windows is what you'll see on social media is You'll see a lot of big fish caught and posted, right? And I know there's more people fishing on the weekends, et cetera, et cetera. But what you'll find is there'll be a period of time where you'll just start seeing bigger fish and then it kind of goes away and then it'll be bigger fish and then it goes away. And so that's somewhat indicative on these lists as well. Uh, now the good part about it is we're, we're capturing this data again from Virginia all the way to South Texas. So typically there's something being caught uh, pretty much the duration of the month, right? And registered, so that's good. Um, but you can you can see it if you follow like a certain, I mean, I'm from Louisiana and I am obviously live in Texas, but you can see even in those two fisheries and the friends that I have uh, from those two fisheries, there's definitely like those feeding windows that kind of ebb and flow uh, with the moon phase throughout the month. It's just interesting to me. All right. Hey, what I'm gonna do here in a sec is, instead of kind of scrolling through with my finger like I traditionally do, I'm actually gonna try to be somewhat high tech here and uh, get to, um, and look at the questions here. So give me a sec. All right, let me scroll through. It's funny, I can see myself looking down. All right. So, hold on one second, I gotta turn the volume down. All right, Colin, good question. Do I see more fish uh, caught in the weekends versus the weekdays, regardless of cellular activity? Um, the only time I really see that, see that true correlation is around the holidays. Um, it's interesting because like this year, and I even mentioned that in one of the posts that I had earlier this year, but the week of like pre-Thanksgiving, man alive, on the trophy trout citation list, uh, it went bananas. So I think I said it, yeah, between the 20th and the, let's say the 25th, right, of November, there were one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There were not, just at a glance, there are nine fish that were caught during that week. And so that, not only is fall just a phenomenal time to fish, but not only that, probably the weather, and I, if I remember right, the weather was pretty decent. And um, yeah, November was great. And so, and then you just see an uptick in terms of the amount of people that are fishing uh, during that time. So you're, you're going to, you know, naturally see higher uh, fish catches the same around Christmas. So let's take a look at kind of Christmas to make sure I'm not completely lying Yeah, so one two three four Five Five were and there were ten so there were five there were ten registered in December uh, five of which came in that kind of week prior to Christmas So that should give you some indication there that there's probably just naturally more people uh, during those times and plus the weather just hasn't gone completely kaput, right? And so it's just gonna be uh, a little bit better. D January and December though are, are interesting because I saw on the trophy trout citation list it decline, right? Uh, I saw eight fish, trophy trout citation fish registered um, 
in Texas, but here's the kicker, but it's right here. On the Dirty 30 citation list, there were 14. So again, I don't know if it's true, like, hey, maybe that fish is, or maybe that bait's completely evacuated or completely gone from, um, you know, the fishery and now artificial anglers are, are just able to target those bigger bites during those months. But yeah, January and March, both had 14 uh, fish caught. I also have another theory with regards to that, and I think it's with related to uh, sullen or activity for no other reason and if you go back to recent events with regards to January and March is we had what two eclipses right and so um, it's been crazy right those hot like whatever is going it, it, you know in space is definitely having an impact because we're seeing definitely an uptick with regards to those big fish uh, feeding and so look at both of those sullener days for those particular months and you'll see that they're actually higher than uh, previous months etc so all right let's go back <laughs> oh god let's see hey Wes no we agree so he put I can't wait to hear this conversation after another year of data the idea is this to continue, we want to continue this program for as long as we're financially able to continue this program, um, cause it costs a little bit of money to, to do, but we love it. We see it as an investment. The way I describe it to people is the, the money it costs to do this program is an investment in our fishery, right? It's an investment in our fishery because the more we understand about these fish, the better we can understand them and, and, and protect them to some extent. So um, we would love to have like 10 years of this data because that sample size is, I think right now, just increasing it to the trophy trout citation is like 200 plus. Let's say, yeah, I think maybe close to 300 now. And so that sample size is growing every year. So once you have maybe like, let's say a thousand, that's going to be really telling is if there's true correlations. And the more we get across the fisheries, I think is going to be super interesting because... I'd love to see the correlation between that. I have been able to see the, the bait tendencies or the angling's lure choice tendencies just from this year alone. And so that's somewhat telling it, it itself. So yeah, we wanna continue to grow it. Another thing is what we had 57 entries last year. Right now we're at 50 already for the Dirty 30 Citation Program. Obviously we're growing in terms of um, people knowing more about it. But in years, let's say we get five to seven years worth of data, are we going to see, um, you know, years that are higher than others? And then so then we can start peeling that onion back in terms of, okay, what are weather anomalies happen? Was there a, a crazy drought or a crazy flood? Or was it just super cold and there was huge fish kills or whatever? And, and maybe we can see that correlation um, to the, to the, peaks and valleys in terms of dirty 30s caught uh, across the years, right? So that would be pretty cool as well. All right, why such a red, or why be a redfish hater? Bob, I'm sorry, man. Um, I, I don't know, they, they will tear up a, yeah. Well, that's actually from a trout, but that's typically what happens and they'll leave a lot less on there uh, to abate. Um, they'll taco the heck out of everything and they'll, they'll kill all your tackle. And so, as a result, um, I can do without them. All right. No, absolutely, Gordy. Uh, and I think I, I mentioned that to some extent. Uh, those monthly forecasts are great tools, but you have to factor in weather conditions of the prior weeks, days. Absolutely, 100% agree. Um, you know, the biggest thing we want to do is make it easy for anglers to register their fish right? But I think it's now time to start asking for a little bit more data upon entry because again, we're trying to grow the data set, but we're trying to grow it with quality data. And so um, asking maybe for time of catch or, and, and really it kind of boils down to me as well, right? Because if I'm looking at those days in which they were caught, if I can peel the onion back in terms of the weather, I think that'd be interesting as well. Okay. 
Uh, Lance, where does the term citation come from? You know, honestly, I really couldn't tell. All I know is like Virginia, North Carolina, and those states up there, um, they ran the citation program. And how the trophy trout citation and the dirty 30 citation program came about, well, they actually give you like a certificate up there. I've never participated in one. I've never seen one. You actually have to register it formally at like, get it like weighed in and measured and this, that, and the other thing at an actual tackle shop. But, um, and then they mail you like a certificate. And so I think they termed it a citation or if it's even called a citation. But the reason I did it was because, and I've talked about this too in the podcast that I've done recently is, um, the reason I started 3030 last year was because I was looking at up in Virginia, in North Carolina, when they were doing these citations, especially North Carolina, they had an absolute ton of enormous fish, speckled trout, being registered and caught and getting citations. And then when they had a really, really bad freeze, and then in this other place called the Hot Ditch shut down, uh, or they shut it down, uh, there was a tremendous, and plus fish poachers and ne the commercial netters just completely decimated that. And so the citations, if I remember right, not to pull that out, was like 140 or 160 in one year. And that's tr trout 25 inches or above, but the amount of trout that were like 29 to 33 inches, I think is what it was, were staggering. And so... After that hard freeze, the poaching, the hot ditch all shut down, it went from like 160 to like, I don't know, maybe two dozen, 30 max. It was nothing. And so I figured, hey, if that's just happening in that fishery, what what's really happening? Like how many 30 inch trout are caught across the fisheries in general? And what can we use or what can we do to understand a little bit more? Because maybe if using that data and having that data there, which they do, uh, but across the states, I think is really telling because if we see that dip and that decline in 30-inch in fish or big fish coming through, uh, that's, we can maybe see that that was in forecast that that was coming or, hey, this isn't normal. And so that's where the term citation, that's where Dirty 30 came from. The encouraging part for me is... The encouraging part for me is in Texas, right? And not only just Texas, but in general, but especially here in Texas, is this is the trophy trout citations, right? And so this is 27 to 30 inches. So, right, 27 to 29 and almost 30 inches, right? And so if you think about it, these fish right here, and the majority of them are released, I think there's a 5% kept ratio these fish right here on this list that are all released minus the 5% are the next class of dirty 30s in the state of Texas. So there's at least 71, uh, you know, trophy trout citations nearing the 30 inch mark. And so to me, that's telling because that's almost like a year class of fish that has reached that almost really full potential. And now that next bumper crop of 30 inch fish. So if we can see that across the fisheries, man, that'd be really cool to see. Anyway. Hopefully that answered your question, Lance. I appreciate you, man. <laughs> all right, we'll get there. Um, all right, Chris, which months and why do you feel is better for targeting these big trout? Um, I got to this with last year's uh, Dirty 30 citation data, and I talked a little bit about it. And go back and listen to Salt Strong Podcast. It's actually, I thought it was really good. We talked a lot about uh, the data and, and mining the data, if you will. Um, and so last year, November, actually, shoot, I have it right here. Give me one, give me one second. <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute. All right. Um, shoot. There it is. It's like literally right in front of my face. Okay. All right. So what we found is all those fish were caught, right? 57. Uh, 14 came in fall, which was October through December. Winter, January through March had 16. Spring was April through June. And then summer was July through September. I'm answering your question in just a second. So if you say, Chris, what's the best month to target these big fish? 
I will tell you depends on what you're fishing with because based off of last year's data, um, in the spring and summer, there were more fish registered on this list that came, um, that came via live bait, that came via live bait, right? Now there, some were, most of them were released, um, and, and a lot more were kept though. But in fall and winter, if you're an artificial guy and love the fish artificials, all but like one. So again, I'm not crazy good at math here, but um, 30 fish. So there were 30 fish across that, that six months. So October through March. Um, of those 30 fish, 29 were caught on artificial baits. 29 were caught in artificial baits. And I think there's something to be said for that. And the reason I say that was because um, if you're into targeting big fish on artificial baits, the colder winter months are hard to beat. Now, if I had my personal opinion, I would probably say November is my absolute favorite month before it gets just crazy, super duper cold, crazy stuff. Um, plus, there's just a, a tremendous amount of bait still in the fishery, but it's dying out. Um, and then on a tail end of that, I would probably say March is eh, late January. March is like my second uh, favorite time of the year. Um, and so I would narrow it down to those two. Now, again, I target, you know, I fish artificial only 100% of the time. And so I've now seen that increasing my odds in terms of fishing those times of year with artificial baits, it holds true that maybe there's just less bait in the, in the, in the fishery. And now what we're starting to see is those fish starting to feed more on, on bigger soft plastics, et cetera, et cetera. And so those two months are my favorite. Hopefully that answered your question. But I'm using the data to kind of to kind of solidify that, that thought process and that fact. And so again, if we continue to grow the data, I think it's gonna be huge. All right, let's see. Uh, Donald, so did you collect the data in 2017? I did, uh, but it was only for the Dirty 30 uh, citation program. We didn't have the trophy trout citation program because honestly, we didn't really think about it. But the more we started thinking about it, we're like, man, a 27 inch trout in Mississippi is like a 30 inch fish in Texas. And so that, that's a data point, right? That's a big fish for that estuary. That's a big fish for that fishery. And so we need to capture that because we can, again, grow the data set and it's just as much of a tremendous feat there as it must just catching a 30 inch trout here is. All right, let's see. How many trophy trout does your data show were caught during a major as opposed to a minor? Uh, does it take a long swig of beer? Because honestly, Dario, I don't have an answer for you, man. That's where we can get after it, I guess, right? For 2019, 20 um, is starting to capture those times and then going back and then data mining the majors and minors for those days for that estuary, et cetera, et cetera, because we do ask for location. I just don't have an answer for you right now. I can sell from my own personal opinion or my own personal experience. Uh, I would actually it was all but one, and this is a great story. And actually I'll end on this because, um, I'll end on this and I'll get to everybody else's questions via, you know, messaging and stuff like that, which I always do. But it was, it was January. So it was January. I made a trip down there. I went and fished with a buddy of mine and it was in terms of the weather, it was the absolute perfect day. It like to be outside and enjoy an outside like day, especially for winter. It was again January, but it was like mid sixties, low to mid sixties. Well, it started out like in the upper forties, but it was gradually warming into the low to mid sixties. Uh, water temp was still pretty, like upper fifties, but it was dead, and I mean dead calm. There wasn't a breath of air, man. I mean there was nothing moving. And so I had been on these fish uh, for a while. And so I went back there to just try to target. Now we had a mid-morning major. It was crazy. We had a mid-morning major kicking in at like nine o'clock. So from like nine to 11, um, 
it, it, it was a, a really highly rated day and <laughs> it was crazy it was a highly rated day and so I went out there and I fished on a Saturday and again I, I don't really like to fish on weekends just because of, of, of traffic and everything else and so I went though and we get there and if you know me and you and you fish with me man I get there like in the dark fishing in the dark set up in the dark um, and, and I like to fish into the light, right? I don't like to be running around and then getting there. I like to be set up, postured, kind of preparing to go uh, in the dark, maybe just a slight hint of light. And so getting out there, you know, started on my flat in the dark, caught one on the top water. Okay, it's a little 16 incher, caught two on the top water. You know, I caught my second one on top water, about an 18, 20 inch fish. And so that bite kind of lasted. My buddy was trailing behind because he was tying some leaders. I'll leave him. Man, if you ain't ready to go, I'm leaving you. I'm sorry. I'm ready to go. Um, but I'm out there. And so he, he wades up next to me. He catches one is like 21 inches on a top piece. And so we're like, man, this is going to be a really good day because this is like natural feeding period. Sun's just coming up. Uh, we're getting ready to come into that major, so man, the things are getting ready to go off. And so I was actually throwing, uh, where are you at? I know, I actually have it out. I'm here, right here. So, little mirror lore, mirror mullet, Junior, the little bitty guy. And I uh, love this little bait, man, especially in those super calm days because it has a really quiet entry into the water. Uh, it doesn't really, you know, walk side to side a whole heck of a lot. It kind of stays kind of tight. But it doesn't have a huge, you know, audible uh, presence, so it's really kind of natural. And so as I'm working that bait, it's almost natural, especially, and, and so it's not putting out a lot of noise and scaring those fish, right? And so, <clears throat> boom, caught one, 27 inch, um, get her weight, or yeah, actually didn't get her weight, got her measured, uh, released the fish, she's gone, and so uh, we turned her loose. Caught like two or three more, and then all of a sudden, um, boat came by, zoom, kind of almost burned us to some extent. Okay, that bite kind of fizzled, and then what happened is another boat kind of came past, set up on a, on a wade a little bit ahead of us, and uh, like, okay. And so it then shifted, the bite, the top water bite just completely shut down. And so I shifted gears, and those fish were still there, the bait was still present. And so I, I switched over to a shadow wrap shad. Uh, it's a lip jerk bait, and it doesn't get down maybe foot, foot and a half. Um, and so uh, throwing that, boom, ca caught my first one, kind of got him fired up on a jerk bait. And so my buddy didn't have a jerk bait. And so I had another one. I'm fumbling around in my box to get him one. I caught two or three more fish, 20, 23 inches, something like that. And then all of a sudden, you know, another guy comes up. He kind of zooms us. Another drifter kind of starts drifting close to the area. And all of a sudden, we're just kind of surrounded, you know, and we're kind of just, you know, continuing to work our flat. And before you know it, I mean, it's just so much presence. There was just way too much presence in the area. Not only that, the water was like crazy clear. So we have crazy clear water, dead calm conditions, a ton of foot traffic. And so once that sun came up, and really got elevated, the bite completely shut down. Top water, jigs, everything. And we were coming into a major. And I'm like, okay, man, that major is gonna kick in again and that bite's gonna come back too. It never did. And I go back to, I think the major, as a part of that natural feeding period, in those conditions, it never really transpired because there was so much traffic and so much other factors and it, it wasn't that the fish weren't ready to feed. I think the fish just got out of there. You know, they were probably feeding somewhere else that was probably less pressured or whatever it is. But in that particular instance, that bite just shut down. And so that's where understanding the cylinder and knowing that it's not completely perfect, you have to live with that, right? But understanding there have been way too many days on the other side where I've been entering a major or entering a minor uh, feeding period and I've caught them like right smack dab in the middle uh, of that time. And so um, more often than not, honestly, more often than not. So, um, but
but you got to pay attention to your surroundings, your conditions and everything else. And so that major or minor may never transpire. Uh, and then obviously if that fishing pressure gets too much or, or, or conditions aren't right, then you, you need to move on. And so anyway, um, hopefully this was helpful. My God, um, that was a lot of information. What time is it? That was a really long, <laughs> that was a really long one. Um, so I'll get to everybody's questions. Um, afterwards, I really appreciate those who stuck around and stick around. We've covered a lot of stuff with trophy trout, uh, moon phase, and understanding the cylinder. Please, if you have those citation fish, keep registering them. Uh, we want the data. The more we have, obviously we share that with you, and the more we have, the more understanding we have uh, about our fishery and about our, you know, our love and our passion for, for big speckled trout. So uh, until next time, guys. Hit me up if you need anything. Until next time, tight lines, God bless, and always take what you need and release the rest. Take care.